Thank you so much, Gina. I, this call could have not been made possible without the help of Gina and Olivia today. So I definitely want to thank you all uh, for sticking in with me and being able to, um, you know, help out through on the technical side. So I definitely want to, you know, w welcome everyone to our NAC telehealth office hours. Today is Thursday, April 8th, and my name is Philip Stringfield. And once again, I just want to welcome you all to today's telehealth office hour session. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as we do get started, we want to just make sure that your audio is muted in order to help navigate throughout today's call. We don't want to have as minimal interruptions for today's presenter as possible, so we want to thank you for that as well. Um, but of course, if you do have any issues, feel free to uh, contact us. You can contact me at tstringfold at nap.org, or you can always simply try to unmute your audio and reconnect it. Um, that typically will help you navigate throughout most of them. Uh, next slide. Sorry about that. Um, and that gives you kind of more information on how you can reconnect and disconnect, and it should uh, be a solution for you uh, throughout today's call. Um, also, just want to go ahead and let you know on the right-hand side of your screen, next slide, you can go ahead and talk. Um, you can talk with today's presenters and have direct engagement through the chat feature. So if you do have questions, we will definitely encourage those and ask you to put them in the chat box that's located to the right of your screen. And you can always raise your hand if you like to have direct engagement. Um, when the time does come. So we will have a time for Q&A. Feel free to put it in the chat, or like I said, we can unmute you when the time is right. Next slide, please. And um, before we get started, I did want to just remind you all of some of the upcoming events that we do have. Um, we have our Elevating Postings for Operations Virtual Training. This is our three out of three virtual trainings that we've done for our operations folks this year. And our last one's going to be the June 15th through 16th. Um, and we'll definitely have more information on our, our website, uh, NAC.org, if you'd like to find out more information about it. And I can always send that as a follow-up email, too, so you can find out how to register and get your team in on the next meeting. Next slide. All right. And then, so, uh, before we dive in, just wanted to also just put in another plug for our NAC EHR user groups. So, we do host five EHR user groups, uh, Athena One, Athena Flow, and Athena Practice. Uh, eClinical Work, Greenway Energy, and NextGen Healthcare. And of course, these groups meet on a monthly to quarterly basis to discuss everything that involves with the EHR and upcoming updates and what other uh, best practices health centers are using in order to stay, stay abreast on what's going on in responding to COVID-19 and utilizing telehealth and other services to reach their clients. And so next slide kind of gives me a perfect uh, introduction into today's a highlight, which is going to be around the state assistive technology programs, and I'm glad to have with me uh, this great team from uh, the U.S. Administration for Community Living, uh, Lloyd Gerhard, um, who serves as the Director of Office of Interagency Innovation, uh, Rob Gornsdahl, who serves as the Assistive Technology Act Program Manager, uh, David Shearer, uh, who serves as the Center Director of Programs and Technical Assistance, and Marty Exlin, as well, who serves in Technical Assistance. Uh, so I want to thank this team for being able to be here to share with us. I definitely think it's going to be great information and great programs and incentives for you all uh, that you can utilize within your health centers and really um, assisting your patients in some of the uh, grant opportunities that you have and other things that you have as we are responding to COVID-19. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Lori. Um, you can just let us know if you would like to share your screen or if you would like us to share um, the materials for you, Lori. Can you hear me uh, now? Sorry yeah, I about can that. hear you now, Lori. No worries. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm I'm happy to uh, share the slides and advance them. All right. Perfect. Just let us know if you need assistance. You should be able to go up top to where it says uh, file and share content. Can you see the slide? Olivia or Gina? Yes, we can. Yes, you're looking great. Okay, awesome. wonderful.
Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today about the Assistive Technology Act program. Uh, we're hoping that um, by the end of the session today um, that we'll, you'll know about the 56 State Assistive Technology Act programs. We'll highlight some common goals we have uh, between the uh, National Community Health Center Association and um, some opportunities to partner. And um, you'll be familiar with what the Assistive Technology Act programs do, and you'll also be able to find your State Assistive Technology Act program, and you'll have some resources. And we're really eager to engage in some questions um, with you and, and provide some answers as we go through the presentation. We'll wait till the end to entertain questions, but if you do have any questions while we're talking, please enter them into the chat. So the State Assistive Technology Act program is administered by the U.S. Administration for Community Living, and we're an operating division within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So our sister agencies are like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the National Institutes for Health, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Health Resources Services Administration, um, and, and others, the Administration for Children and Families, uh, to name a few. So, um, and we're charged, our goal is to really help older adults, people with disabilities, and caregivers live full lives in the community. Uh, one of the programs that we administer is the uh, Assistive Technology Act. Um, it is funded at about $32 million annually, and we provide formula grants to 56 states and territories. And we also fund a Technical Assistance Resource Center, AT3, and you'll get to hear from them in just a few minutes. Um, and a data analysis center, Katata. And um, there's data from all 56 state AT programs on the Katata website. So you'll also be able to check out your state AT program and see how it's doing. Um, and I wanted to just note how the state AT programs really are engaged in helping people use technology to engage with others. And so their charge is to help people with disabilities of any age, and these could be people that um, have a temporary or permanent disability, uh, to become aware of the assistive technology and how they can acquire that technology, to learn about assistive technology op options and use them. You know, um, many of us have smartphones, but a lot of people don't even know that some of the technologies they have have assistive technology built into them. And um, what we find sometimes with the state AT programs is just a few minute conversation with people and then show them something. They're like, oh man, wish I would have known this uh, a year ago or yesterday. This would have been so helpful. So um, there's really some short things, short term things we can do or short time taking things that we can do that really do enable people to um, better use their devices and also better interact and communicate with others. Um, the AT programs help, um, they enable people to try technology through short-term loans before they purchase it. And this is really important because, you know, we're all unique individuals. And so what works for one person may not work for another person. And there's many technologies to um, help support people who may be confronting a disability. And, um, and so finding the right technology that really works for you and your life is really important. And the AT programs are really critical in helping people do that. And then the other thing that state AT programs do is they acquire gently used assistive technology and refurbish it. And they make it available at low cost or no cost to people um, who could benefit from it. So um, those are some highlights about what the AT programs do. But I'd like to turn things over now to um, David Shear, who is the director for the Assistive Technology Act um, Technical Assistance Program, or Technical Assistance Center, and that um, is AT3. So David, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, uh, Gina, and everybody and your team for having us today. Like a good administrator, I've assigned uh, the uh, talking part of our slide presentation uh, to Marty Exline, the director of the AT3 Center, and I'm going to avail myself at the end of the presentation to assist in the Q&A. So, Marty, would you take it from here? Sure, David. Um, 
Yeah, and I think uh, a really important point is, um, and I think Lori kind of alluded to that is, is we really do share a lot of program goals between the community health centers, um, I think the state primary care associations um, to help individuals with functional limitations or who have disabilities um, throughout our, our states um, to live in their communities um, as fully as they possibly can. Um, certainly, uh, uh, the state AT programs are, are statewide programs or, or territory-wide. There's, Lori mentioned, there's 56 programs. Um, a lot of them do have uh, regional sites where they provide services. So certainly, whether somebody is in an urban area or in a rural area, um, they should be able to access their assistive technology program and definitely see a lot of opportunities for partnerships, I think. Um, certainly one would be increasing the awareness among uh, people who utilize the community health centers about what assistive technology is, what kinds of devices are out there that can help somebody in their homes or their communities, in employment, in education, just in really any area of their lives. Um, and uh, certainly connecting people to the assistive technology that might work best for them. Again, Lori mentioned a couple of the services that the AT programs provide, um, device demonstrations and short-term <coughs> home programs. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, training on assistive technology, uh, I could see definitely some opportunities for uh, maybe some joint trainings. Um, certainly, I think from the community health center perspective or the, the primary care associations talking about the kinds of people that um, that you serve that that might be um, interested or might be able to benefit from assistive technology. And then also, I think training on um, the kinds of services that your state provides our state assistive technology program. And I think to some technical assistance opportunities. Um, a lot of the assistive technology programs in states, they work through, um, collaborate with their state um, developmental disability organizations, uh, Medicaid programs, vocational rehabilitation programs, or their state departments, departments of education. So could certainly see some opportunities for some collaborations that might be specific to, to your particular state or your particular uh, region or communities with uh, state uh, assistive technology programs. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how to find the assistive technology program um, in your state toward the end, but why don't you go ahead and advance to the next slide. So one of the services that um, assistive technology programs provide and this is a, a core service that almost every assistive technology program provides, is um, device demonstrations. And um, in-person or virtual demonstrations, they help um, people with the opportunity to learn about what kind of device might work best for them, um, what, the, what the features are of a device, um, and maybe look at a selection of different devices to compare and contrast. Um, before COVID, certainly a lot of those device demonstrations were in, in person at, uh, at an AT program or one of their contractors. Uh, a lot of those, of course, now are being done virtually because of COVID. Um, but uh, some of those are now with people getting vaccinated. I think in certain circumstances, some people are able to get in-person in -person demonstrations. Um, but whether it's in-person or virtually, it's, it's to help people decide what might work best for them, what kinds of devices might work best. So for example, um, finding out about features of tablets or computer input devices um, or other types of assistive technology. And this is especially program um, important now, of course, with all these online features in terms of registering for vaccinations or testing, um, telehealth, um, virtual learning, um, all sorts of, or social engagement services, all sorts of types of services. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So another uh, activity that I think that the community health centers would be particularly 
interested in is uh, their device loan programs. So people can actually, or organizations can borrow devices um, to try out to see if it works best in their particular environment, whether it's at school or at work or in their homes, um, see what might work best. Um, and here's a, a couple of examples. Um, that could be a low tech speech generating device or hearing amplification amplification device that can be borrowed to use at a vac vaccination site or a telehealth visit. Um, I know there's a couple of programs. I know that, for instance, in North Carolina and, and California, and, and for examples, they've helped out with uh, vaccination sites in terms of providing some types of assistive technology um, at those sites. The uh, inventories of the types of, of devices consist of a wide variety. And most every state has a listing or an inventory of the kinds of devices that can be borrowed on their websites. So you can go in and look at what might be available um, to see if there might be um, a type of device that might be uh, particularly useful to that individual. Um, and generally, you can borrow devices for um, it just varies from state to state, but typically it could be from a, a several week period, could be to four to six weeks. I know in some cases, um, because of COVID, some states have extended those loan periods um, depending on the, the individual's needs. Go ahead and jump to the, the next site. And one thing I'll, I'll mention just in terms of uh, um, the device loans, um, uh, some examples might be tablet devices or laptops. Uh, certainly, in terms of accessibility, if somebody needed to borrow, for instance, uh, a tablet device for a telehealth visit, um, obviously some of those devices have built-in accessibility features, um, things like uh, uh, read aloud features like voiceover or magnifiers for people that maybe have low vision and, and have trouble seeing the screens. Um, can do things like maybe inverting the colors on the screens if somebody is able to read something better in a different in a different background or different shade. Um, some have different kinds of headphone accommodations to customize the sounds that um, come through uh, through the computer. Uh, could be changing an audio from a balanced tone to um, higher frequency sounds or, or vocals in middle frequencies, depending on, on what the person's uh, uh, hearing issues are. And I do want to emphasize in terms of, of device loan programs, if it's not just uh, telehealth type devices or tablets, it could it's a wide variety of devices that people have available. For, uh, aids for daily living from um, things that can help people cook or um, home safety devices, environmental controls, um, hearing, low vision, speech generating devices. So it's a wide variety of devices. In terms of um, realization programs, um, states take in um, devices that are no longer needed by an individual. Um, they refurbish them and make them available, um, like Lori mentioned, at no cost or very low cost for individuals who might need those devices. So certainly one common type of device or uh, wheel mobility devices, wheelchairs, um, manual or power wheelchairs, uh, different types of aids for daily living. Um, we think about communication devices. We're thinking about speech generating devices or um, you might know them as augmentative communication devices for people that can't uh, speak or have difficulty vocalizing what they need. Uh, certainly part of the programs, utilization programs, are that they have revised sanitation procedures to protect health and safety, both of their staff and certainly of the people who are borrowing devices. And jump to the next slide. So another core service of the assistive technology programs are state financing activities. And one type of financing activities, um, most states have some type of uh, financial loan programs with um, typically lower interest and favorable terms. So people who maybe can't get a loan 
for an assistive technology device through a typical lender might be able to get one through an assistive technology program. And again, for almost any type of assistive technology, could be for a vehicle modification. Um, like here's an example of somebody with a ramp coming out of a, a van. Could be for a communication device, uh, for hearing aids, um, just almost any kind of assistive device. Could be for a computer um, or again, uh, a laptop or a, a tablet device. And then a lot of state AT programs, um, some of them provide other types of state financing um, activities in addition to um, their financial loan programs. So some of them um, operate their state's uh, adaptive tele excuse me, telecommunication equipment programs. So could be um, in some states adaptive telephones are available, uh, iPads, tablet devices. So it just depends on the particular state in terms of um, whether they operate their um, telecommunications equipment programs. But most states do have some type of telecom, adaptive telecom programs. Um, I think uh, another example might be um, North Dakota has a, a seniors program where they provide uh, adapted equipment for seniors, could be safety devices, amplifiers, grab bars, uh, bed rails, just all sorts of things. So it's definitely in your interest to, to contact your state assisted technology program. And you can see from this slide, um, if you go to the www.atcenter.net and look at the directory of state programs, you can find all the contact information you need about your state AT program, look at their website, um, of course, telephone contacts, but you can also look at uh, the contact information. If you wanna contact the person for that particular activity directly, the email addresses uh, for each of those different types of programs for device loan or device demonstration, you can look on that directory and um, find your state program and, and the individuals that you wanna contact. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and leave it there, Lori. Um, see if anybody, if anybody else have anything they wanna share. And thank you so much, Marty. Um, we have a couple of slides here that provide some resources for telehealth communications, platforms and applications with hyperlinks um, in these slides to access some of this information. And many of you are probably using some of these platforms. Um, and, and so we wanted to share that. We also um, have a slide that provides um, links to some of the web webinars that have been developed um, and provide training and technical assistance on the use of remote technologies. Uh, so wanted to provide that to you too. Um, also with us today is Rob Grunendahl and Rob leads the AT programs and actually manages them here at ACL. Um, Rob, is there anything you'd like to add to the presentation? Yeah, I just want to, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I just want to say that, you know, of all the activities that Mari discussed in this presentation, you know, for access and acquisition of assistive technology, you know, including the state level activities, as well as the state leadership activities, you know, AT3 in the slide previously, you know, was instrumental in putting together some trainings to assist individuals with access to remote technology platforms as well as also assisting all of the AT programs to conduct those virtual device demonstrations. And so I know that we're looking here today at you know, some, of the, um, some of the devices that can assist individuals with that telepresence, the platforms, but you know, the AT programs um, assist individuals to address all kinds of functional needs. And that includes vision, hearing, speech communication, you know, which, which Mar Marty illustrated and also all the way up to, um, you know, individuals even being able to potentially uh, purchase uh, vans, have uh, ve vehicle modifications. Uh, don't forget recreation, sports and leisure for individuals, especially in today's day and age, you know, it's so important to address um, some of the risks of social isolation, daily living needs, in, in Marty noted environmental adaptations. And so when you look at the Assistive Technology Act programs, 
I mean, certainly there are some guiding principles that are actually within the statute. There's a definition of assistive technology, but it really is all about that cultural change for individuals to embrace these um, assistive technology devices, durable medical equipment, smart home, uh, smart home equipment, uh, you know, modifications to homes, so people can lead a fuller life. And that's really the key um, to the AT programs and assisting individuals with disabilities across the lifespan. Thank you, Rob. And um, Rob, would you mind also mentioning a little bit of information too about the maker movement and how that worked? So the AT maker movement, um, certainly there are some some programs that are, do a really good job with that. There's uh, the, New Jer uh, the New Hampshire AT Act program. Um, they, they've been um, very involved with the AT maker movement where, where individuals can actually fabricate um, devices that could help them out. It might be mounts for devices, mounts for cell phones, and other types of items that can assist individuals with the daily living tasks. I know that also the Pennsylvania AT program uh, received some, some additional funds to have a project um, to assist um, older adults even to, to um, get more into those types of uh, devices that can assist them with everyday needs. And so I think, again, it really does come back to you know, when you think about assistive technology, you know, assist, you know, assistive technology and technologies are, you know, are items that can that make life that make essentially tasks easier for all of us. But it makes it possible. You know, it it's 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 a possibility for individuals um, who experience disabilities, and that's the key point. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, this slide will provide some information on how to get in touch with us. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out um, if you have questions. And it also provides links to the um, Assistive Technology AT3 Center and also the um, Center for Assistive Technology Act data, Katata. Um, and with that, um, our presentation is finished and we would love to um, engage in some conversation with you all to learn more about how we can be working together and answer any questions you might have. Well, hi again, everyone and Lori and team. Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. And uh, my sense is that for us in the health center world, uh, we may not have known as much about these programs you described to us. So it's it's really helpful to learn. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on um, what are the ways in which you've seen some communities uptick the utilization of this program? Could you describe sort of where maybe you started slow somewhere and it's gained momentum and how did that happen? And while you're Elaborating on that, I'm going to ask folks if they have got questions or comments, please chat it up and we'll triage it. Absolutely, we're, we're happy to respond to that question. And um, I, I, I have um, two states that come to mind. Uh, one is Virginia and the other one is Connecticut, but I'm sure Rob and Marty and Dave probably have some too. But Rob, um, you're very familiar with the Virginia um, work that's gone on. Do you want to talk a little bit about how um, the AT program is, is partnering there? Yeah, I mean, if you think about um, going back a little ways with respect to, you know, where the AT Act program was housed. So prior to coming over to HHS ACL, uh, the AT programs were housed at the U.S. Department of Education Rehabilitation Services Administration. And so when, when the AT programs moved over uh, to HHS ACL, you know, there certainly was more of a focus on serving um, individuals who, who are older. Um, at Department of Education, it, there was uh, more of an education employment related focus. Um, and so with, with, within the state of Virginia, you know, while it took some time to coordinate, um, they, they were able to work with the no wrong door system uh, in their state. And I know if you're familiar with the no wrong door system, but it's, um, it, it comprises uh, Triple A's, which are area agencies on aging, ADRCs, Aging Disability Resource Centers, 
um, serving also uh, individuals um, connected with independent living veterans. And so they've, they've been able to expand their focus um, to, to serve, serve within the system um, and provide some, some needed uh, information to get people connected to the resources that they need, that they may need. Uh, and so it's, it's certainly been a good, uh, a good collaborative effort and it's led to, you know, even um, uh, the development of, of individuals uh, attaining uh, assistive technology kits, focusing on uh, social connectedness, focusing on uh, emergency preparedness, and so just the, the overall awareness of um, what is out there in terms of assistive technology. Um, you know, there, there, are other, there are other states out there um, that have enhanced their, their um, efforts to uh, coordinate activities, um, you know, within their state. You can go from Virginia all the way over, you know, to, to Idaho, where they had a, a, a great push there in terms of trying to assist individuals to, to learn about uh, personal, uh, even like personal emergency re response systems for folks who are older, um, alerting, alerting systems, um, you know, certain just simple devices that, that help individuals with, with uh, fall prevention. Um, and so it's really about just helping individuals to lead better, um, better lives as they also age. And so I think one of the, the, the great um, things about moving over from ACL, moving over from RSA to ACL is that just enhancing that ability to, um, to expose assistive technology and, to, and have individuals be more aware of, you know, what is out there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a never ending task because a lot of people including older folks are, are perhaps you know, not as, as aware about assistive technology, but that's why we're doing uh, events such as this. Uh, thanks, Rob. Dave, I saw your screen come on. Did you have an example you wanted to share? Well, I would just like to inform this group that uh, as Rob's alluded to, the uh, state and territory AT programs provide services to people of all ages uh, across all spectrums from education and work to community living and to staying in their homes. They, uh, assistive technology is a large umbrella under which they operate and uh, many states do things in a variety of different ways. And there are a lot of great highlights of what of things that are happening in individual states. Um, certainly, some of those include the latest pushes to uh, try to address social isolation and those programs uh, that are leading the charge in those areas range from the very populous states of Connecticut and the eastern seaboard to uh, a more sparsely in frontier state like Wyoming uh, that have created partnerships with other agencies within the state to deliver services to people in need. And the AT programs are constantly looking for opportunities to partner with and work together with uh, anyone who has and shares the same common goals of helping people to lead full and inclusive lives. And the community health centers are certainly, uh, in our opinion, one of those groups that uh, state and territory AT programs can provide information and resources to and connections uh, that will improve the lives of all the people we serve. Yeah, and just- Yeah, thanks Dave. Oh, go ahead, Marty. I'm just gonna, just to add on to that, I do think that the community health centers um, may serve a lot of people who maybe are not tied into other disability organizations, like maybe there's an awful lot of people that may not be tied into their developmental disability system or um, other disability agencies, or even maybe their home and community, um, uh, home community services waivers or those kinds of things. So I just think that it, it's one way of reaching out to people that maybe would not normally know about their AT program. Yeah, Marty, that's a really great point. And so if you're a community health center and you're thinking about, well, so how could I get started or how could the AT program be helpful to me? Um, let me share a couple of examples. So in um, Georgia, 
the AT program at Georgia Tech is actually building into their assessment tool um, strategies around potential assistive technology that might be available for different activities of daily living. Um, so it triggers people to be thinking about, oh, well, maybe this type of assistive technology could be helpful. That's, that's one example. And they're building it into the, um, the assessment tool, D-O-N-R. Um, and which is widely used by a lot of aging and disability organizations, and I'm not sure the extent to which um, community health centers might be using that tool, but the approach is something that maybe could get built into assessment tools that community health centers uh, use. And I'm sure that um, Carolyn Phillips and her team would be willing to talk with you all some more about that if there's interest in that. In addition, there's a YouTube video, and we'll, we'll send a link to you on this. Um, in Georgia, they strategically use um, uh, speakers um, like Echo Dot and um, uh, to get uh, to help people that were in institutions or nursing homes return back to the community. So a community health center might be working with someone who's been into the hospital, returning back home. The Assistive Technology Act program could really be instrumental in helping with that assessment of, well, are there assistive technologies that could benefit that person to have a successful experience at home? Um, what are some of the challenges they're confronting? And there might be some solutions that are readily available. North Carolina comes to mind, and Tammy Kroger um, runs that program, and they, they've they just been doing really fabulous work with veterans who are farmers who are coming back with disabilities. When they left, they didn't have a disability. They went and defended our freedom. They came back with a disability. And their, you know, um, their profession is farming. So they're helping them um, get connected to adaptive equipment that enables them to continue to farm. And, and so there could be experiences that people that are coming to the community health center have that things they used to enjoy that they still no longer can do because they might be experiencing arthritis or they could have a chronic condition that's starting to create some type of functional limitations for them. But there might be devices out there that could actually enable them to continue to do the things they enjoy. And the AT programs can be very instrumental in that. Um, and I have to tell you, the creativity with the AT programs, like, they're they're up for a challenge. You don't tell them something can't be done because they're gonna find a way. And they've got an awesome network. Uh, Wyoming comes to mind in that um, they have they use Project Echo, and they were using it um, pre-COVID for students with disabilities to really be thinking about what's the assistive technology that really helps that student be engaged in the learning process and being engaged in the classroom. And so with the Project ECHO approach, they're able to reach the specialist or the expertise wherever it might be in the country um, and or the world. And so that's been really, really instrumental. But those are just a couple of examples. Um, you know, we're not as familiar with some of the challenges that the community health centers experience. So it might be helpful too to learn if there's some challenges community health centers experience. And as you're hearing about some of these examples, um, ways in which the AT programs could possibly be helpful or challenges you're having that maybe you haven't solved yet that we could try to help solve. Lori, David, Marty, Rob, thanks for these examples. Um, you know, our community health centers are regularly screening for what we call the social determinants of health and the status of our patients when it comes to things like uh, housing, circumstances or food insecurity, safety in the home, things like that. And so um, I think uh, I'm reading some private chat that's coming into me and it's resonating that this kind of fits in that social determinants realm for us in some ways. Um, I think that challenges the accessibility of these programs. Does the process require kind of a middle broker uh, or can an individual directly access the programs? You talked about points of contact, but if a health center really wanted to consider promoting these programs you've talked about today, what would it take to really access these wonderful resources? 
Dave, um, Dave, were you going to share? You're on mute. Thank you, Lori. Also, I, Gina and, and all, uh, I just wanted to share that this could all begin with a telephone call or an email. Uh, these programs are accessible to everyone, every individual, uh, every business, every community uh, within their borders. So uh, they all have uh, various types of promotional materials uh, that they would be more than happy to supply to you the community health centers, um, and they're certainly all there to answer your, any of your questions. A big part of what they do is information and referral. So um, whether it is a need of a community health center or a person that you serve, uh, th those referrals can all be made and, uh, and, and the AT programs are just waiting to hear from you. Dave, thank you so much for that reassurance that we can utilize the lists um, that you've sent us today to find locally the most appropriate contact. And um, certainly I would encourage any of my colleagues that are on this call, if you have any other questions or comments at this time, um, go ahead and bring them forth. And maybe we'll just give folks a minute or two. Yeah, I just just want to note while folks might be formulating a question, you know, it's um, obviously, you know, we're we're available for follow up via email. Um, all four of our contact uh, information is provided, and so please don't hesitate to reach out um, if, even if you need some assistance in identifying the appropriate person in this state or territory where you reside. Uh, maybe some um, guidance on, you know. Who to contact first, or some, you know, field some questions with respect to you know awareness of um, specific uh, assistive technology devices. Just be mindful that you know AT devices can be anywhere from medication reminders to some very very high tech devices to assist individuals uh, to lead um, uh, enhanced lives in their communities. Rob, thank you for that comment. And I think that did give folks a few minutes to formulate some, some questions and comments. Um, I did want to read to you uh, one of the questions that came in and comments. Lots of great tools that patients could benefit from here that you've presented to us, um, but bringing it back into kind of the telehealth realm, realm we're curious about if the assistive technology programs have tools that might assist with broadband access and what the intersection with internet needs are. Well, I'll just. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I'll just obviously, I mean, in terms of uh, devices to access the internet, you know, we talked a little bit about folks, the device loan program, making things like tablets available, or those kinds of things. But yes, the, the broadband access is a huge issue in, in every state. Um, some states that have, uh, you know, partnered with, um, with their ADRCs have, um, actually made um, have activities where they're making things like MiFi is available. Um, so in terms of access, but uh, again, that's that's obviously a huge issue in, in especially in rural areas of every state. I would only add that um, it would be in the interest of everyone to uh, become aware of where there are uh, public access points within your own community. And if you're operating your telehealth system uh, on a very secure platform, then individuals who do not perhaps have broadband access personally may be able to go to those community uh, hotspots like their public library, a community hall, uh, a fire department, and uh, interact and access 
the broadband services that you're utilizing uh, in those places. And your state or territory AT programs are, are certainly available to help uh, assess and, and identify what some of those possibilities are because the broadband issue is a national issue and it varies widely from state to state. And there is an awful lot of new and current activity planned and underway regarding access to broadband. So we're all uh, involved in the uh, learning process and the constant uh, need to be aware and updated on what's happening locally when it comes to broadband access. And David and Marty, I would say, you know, we're just learning now what's coming out of the American Recovery Plan and in particular out of the FCC and USAC where health centers have over the years historically gone to particularly our rural health centers and rural communities to get that additional um, subsidy to help us go that last mile on internet access. And I'm noticing, and hopefully he won't mind me putting him on the spot, um, Bill England, who is HRSA's uh, senior advisor on telehealth is with us today. And Bill, I imagine you have a few updates and things to say to this group about this question of internet access. Oop. Bill, I'm going to ask my tech host to unmute you. I'm sorry. And there you go. Yeah, that was me. I, I have major construction going on about 10 feet from me um, in my house. So uh, hopefully it'll be OK. Um, yeah, so I just got on five minutes ago. And since I talked to you, Gina, yesterday, already new information. Yes, it's moved. Things are moving at lightning speed. Uh, last week, the FCC published a, a, an order implementing COVID round two funding. Last spring, um, about 15% of the $200 million that they released under COVID-1 went to health centers. In the order they just released for round two, uh, I, I, which I just went through trying to digest last night, health centers get extra points. Um, health centers and rural gets extra points. Uh, critical access hospital gets extra points, which means you stand a little bit ahead of others in having some of the next 250 million. Um, the critical piece is there will be a one week application window for it. And the one week application window will start uh, sometime by April 29, 30th. And the FCC is supposed to give a two week warning when the window will open, but they haven't done it yet. So when it's time to jump, you have to jump very fast. So um, we have a webinar on the 21st of April. It'll be a public uh, webinar talking about FCC programs and all the opportunities that are coming along that for both health centers as well as patients. And there's a lot, there's a lot of funding and there's a lot of opportunity uh, both from FCC as well as Department of Commerce and USDA, but I think the FCC programs are the ones that are most in line with what you all will want to know. And uh, um, I, you know, not, I, because I didn't get to hear earlier what what Jonathan or others may have said, we are very much telling our health centers, you guys need to be expert on all this stuff because people are going to make be making calls to you and USAC and the FCC are the main sources of information, but we want to be the people that digest it and are able to answer the questions if you can't understand the documents that you're you're reading. So is that Bill, <laughs> Bill thanks for that and I'll I'll ask our ACL colleagues if you have any reaction or uh, further comments on the broadband and then I think we have time for one more question which I'll pose to you. Hi, Gina. Um, we want to also highlight that next week on the 15th, we're doing an informational webinar, and we can send the announcement over to you after this call um, on the emergency broadband benefit that the FCC is offering. Ed Bartholomew will be uh, speaking and presenting, and that's, that's a benefit that will be open to by April 30th. Um, Bill highlighted, I mean, FCC has really got a lot of opportunity that we all need to um, be leveraging to really affect the populations that we serve. So I uh, just would share that. And some of the AT programs also have broadband boosters um, that they can use. That doesn't necessarily work for a lot of places, but in some places where there's low signal, those could be effective. 
Lori, thanks for that. I think if you could send that notice over about the webinar on the 15th and then Bill, when you've got your notice together um, for the program, send it over and we'll make sure our telehealth mailing list across the country receives those educational opportunities. Thank you both for that. And um, just time here for one more, you know, the reality for our health centers is uh, reimbursement for services and devices that um, we provide to patients and the time it takes for staff to make those connections for patients and clients. And so could you talk a little bit about the assistive technology devices and services you spoke of? Um, is that offered? at no cost or are there eligibility parameters or what's the um, mechanism to support organizations at the community level who wanna maybe be a liaison or a partner in this? Uh, Marty or Dave, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, uh, so in terms of the services that we talked about, in terms of device demonstrations, device loans, um, or some of the other programs, there's there's typically no kind of, of charge for those services. The, the state, the AT Act doesn't allow actual purchase of a device for an individual. But um, for instance, the, the device loan programs in terms of um, borrowing a device for a period um, to is either as to find out if it works for somebody or it's an accommodation, um, then that might be an option too. So, it, but in terms of the services that we mentioned, typically there isn't a charge for somebody to utilize those, except we mentioned as far as the utilization, sometimes there is a, a charge for reutilized devices, but much less than they would um, have to pay uh, purchasing new. And and you know I would I would just add that um, in the American Rescue Plan um, there is also um, I'm sorry there is also um, some funds under Title Three B of the Older Americans Act to address social isolation, home and community based services access for older adults, and also um, getting people to COVID nineteen vaccinations. And um, under that. Um, statutory authority, the area agencies on aging can purchase AT for people. So, um, so there, there's opportunity for great partnership. Um, and these services are out there to help serve older adults and people with disabilities. And so it really makes for a great partnership. Well, thanks for that clarification about sort of the costs associated with your programs, which are clearly meant to improve access and not inhibit folks from taking advantage of that. Um, Lori, David, Marty, Rob, do you have any closing comments that you wanted to share? Any further info for us today? I think the only thing I would add is, is it, it again, um, I think everybody said it, it's worth a, worth a contact, worth a telephone call, worth, an email um, because it might be that your particular state AT program provides exactly the services that, that your community health center or primary care association is looking for. Um, so I would just encourage people to make that contact. Um, did it come up or more? Did you mention the, the $7 billion in E-rate funds that are now gonna be covering kids for education at home? Uh, E-rate is now uh, in, under uh, the um, recent uh, uh, Economic Recovery Act at uh, $7 billion to allow what was the E-rate program serving kids in schools to now serve them at home by putting broadband into people's homes. So if any of the, these are kids and it's for education and I specifically ask, well, can we use it for telehealth? The answer was eh, not, not really, but I mean, you can, it just, you can't get it because you have telehealth needs. But once you put broadband into a home, what exactly it's used for is not going to be really an issue, but it's going to go through a school network. So it may not, 
uh, exactly serve this, but but boy, there's a lot of kids out there that are going to have access to funding for broadband. Bill, thanks for that additional information. Clearly, we need to get onto your webinar in a few weeks time <laughs> as details emerge. Um, I think you all probably are aware health centers have been front and cent central in this administration's vaccination efforts and now an ongoing recovery and our health centers will be really thinking about service and site expansion additional support for our very stretched workforce and so thinking about how what you presented today is not an add-on but an integrated in i think is really um kind of the challenge uh where we're at and you've greatly educated me today and given us good food for thought um, on how we might better support our our patients with disabilities through these resources thank you all of you for your federal service bill included and uh, we will be putting the archive the recording of this webinar up on the health center resource clearing house www.healthcenterinfo.org and within the next couple of weeks so folks can go back and look at that and acl colleagues if you have other materials you want to send our way we'll include it in the archive packet for this call we look forward to keeping in touch we thank you so much for your time and thank you to my health center pca and hccn colleagues who made time for today's call Hope everyone's staying safe and well. Until next time, thank you. Thanks for having us, Gina. Yeah, really nice to see you guys. Take good care. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.